thank you very much for the introduction and thank you very much to the organizers for the opportunity to present here. So I'll talk about combining two very powerful methods in quantum chemistry. One is the DMRG, which I guess does not require any introduction to this audience. And the other one is couple cluster theory, which I guess only a few of you have heard of or seen. So I'll spend some time on, on that. Now, what are the problems that I'm concerning myself with? These are quantum chemical problems. Yeah, so quantum chemistry, for me, is a mathematical framework that allows us to compute all kinds of interesting properties for atoms, molecules, and solids, reaching from very fundamental properties like the stability of matter over to some more surprising properties like the color of gold or superconductivity. And the quantum chemistry framework is by no means restricted to atoms and molecules. It might as well be applied to extended systems like uh, this sheet of twisted bilayer graphene down here. So what is this magical framework that allows us to do all of this? Uh, so I'm pretty sure you all have seen this, this introduction, but I think it's a very cute story. So let's go back some 100 years ago. Back then, the, the hydrogen atom was of interest. So the hydrogen atom is sort of the simplest atom you can think of. It has one nucleus positively charged and one electron negatively charged. And if you shine light through this atom and look at the amount of light that passes through, you see that the hydrogen atom absorbs energy in a discrete manner, i.e. quantized. Now, 100 years ago or so, this was very baffling for scientists. And the one person that really came up with a formal framework that solves this problem was Erwin Schrodinger, uh, who used quantum mechanics, saying that, OK, the electron has a kinetic energy um, because it's moving around. At the same time, it has an attractive force with the nucleus, and these forces have to balance out. And this is how he postulated this eigenvalue problem, 1926. So why do I show you all of this? Well, because the underlying equation is still the same that we are trying to solve today. Yeah, now, of course, we are not concerned with the hydrogen atom anymore. We know that this can be solved analytically. However, we are looking at more complicated systems, for example, H2. Right? So, of course, um, we look at much more complicated systems than H2. So, yeah. but, so you see the, the Hamiltonian very naturally uh, generalizes to the n electron case. We have a kinetic energy coming from here. We have a electron nuclei attraction term. But we have one additional term that we have not seen in the work from 1926. And this is the electron-electron repulsion. Uh, equally charged particles repel each other. And computationally, it's this term that is the troublemaker. Okay. Now, you may say, well, what's the big deal here? We have an eigenvalue problem. Why don't we just discretize it, plug it into MATLAB, and hit solve, or the backslash? Right? So let's do a very quick back of the envelope calculation. Yeah. Let's use uh, CO2 as an example. It's a very innocent looking molecule. And if you remember from high school, oxygen has eight electrons, carbon has six. So that in total gives you 22 electrons. Each electron has three degrees of freedom. So in total, 66 degrees of freedom. So if we were to discretize the eigenvector with, um, let's just take 10 grid points per axis, you end up with 10 to the 66 grid points just to discretize the eigenvector, and that does not involve any operation on the matrix. Right, so this is computationally infeasible. So for quantum chemical problems, approximation is key, and this is what people have been doing for the past, uh, well, I want to say 100 years, but since the invention of the computer, this really took off. So when you Google quantum chemical methods, what you find is actually a bewildering zoo of abbreviations, right? There's a Hartree-Fock, MP2, DFT, and so on. Uh, they all have their own merit. They have their own benefits. And you can see in this picture that as, as you go up in this tower, you sort of increase in accuracy. And uh, now, uh, thanks to Steve, we now have this ladder that allows us uh, direct access to, uh, to the, the heaven of chemical accuracy. Okay, So what, what I will talk about today is a combination of these two methods. So you see the couple cluster theory is very high up on this tower. 
which means that it's a very high accurate method in the community. It's also one of its flavors is known as the gold standard of quantum chemistry. So this is used to benchmark most of the new methods. And the DMRG, as you know, can be a highly accurate method. What, okay. What's MP2? Sorry? What's MP2? So HF is hard refock, I guess? What's yes. MP2? So MP2, depending on who you ask, is either many body perturbation theory, or if you go to the Scandinavian school, it's called Muller Plesset theory. But it's a perturbation ansatz. Um, we basically do Rayleigh Schrodinger to the um, two body potential. Yeah. FCI is full configuration interaction, and this is exact diagonalization. So it's not really, it is a method, right? But as the problem grows very aggressively, it's not really computationally feasible. You, you should not assume everyone in the room knows what the MRG is. Okay, <laughs> yeah. Uh, right, so I think I will not give an introduction to DMRG, but I will talk about the relevant parts. So if there's something that I'm missing, please let me know and I'll try to, uh, to explain. I'm, I'm not shy, but there may be other okay. people who are more shy. Than <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. Yeah. I'll do my best. Yeah, please interrupt whenever you have uh, questions. So let me, before diving into the mathematical details and the more uh, concrete construction of couple cluster theory, let me pictorially describe what the issue at hand is. Okay, so let's assume we have H2, the hydrogen molecule. And let's assume the individual atoms are very far apart, meaning that the electrons, they don't feel each other. So the electron-electron repulsion is negligible. Then the eigenfunction that corresponds to that problem would consist of the individual solutions to the two hydrogen atoms, these two spheres. Uh, so the ground state, the lowest lying energetic state for an hydrogen atom is the first spherical harmonic, which is a sphere, times a radial decay. So now once we start pushing these atoms closer and closer together, at some point the electron-electron repulsion is going to kick in, and this will yield non-trivial deformation of the eigenfunction. So if the Hamiltonian would have a nice separable form, meaning that we can just neglect the electron-electron interaction, we just get these overlapping blobs, we would be very happy, because that's easy to compute. However, what we see, if we solve for H2, uh, the eigenfunction deforms and yields this spheroidal structure or this football-shaped um, kind of thing. Okay. So this effect actually happens at various scales. It happens for small molecules like uh, N2 or a chromium dimer. Uh, it also happens for uh, intermediately sized systems like this transition metal complex, and of course it also happens at large extended systems like this twisted bilayer graphene sheet. So the takeaway of this slide is that strongly correlated methods, strongly correlated systems are extremely difficult to compute. This is sort of the challenge. Yes? Can you explain a bit more detail sort of what makes a transition metal complexes? Uh, why do you have the strong correlations there? Uh, for this one, I think it's the, the unpaired electrons that uh, strongly delocalize in the, in the compound. Uh, so you have a delocalized wave function, you somehow have to, have to resolve this. Now, the catch with these strongly correlated systems is that they provide an extremely useful sandbox to test our methods. You know, they, are, they have failure modes, and we can see whether or not the methods, uh, we can see how these methods fail, and then we can learn about this and improve the computational methods and push the boundaries of what is computationally accessible uh, to this day. So we should really focus on strongly correlated systems when we talk about method development in um, quantum chemistry. So enough of the, the motivation. Let's talk about the uh, roadmap of the remaining uh, 30 minutes. So I will introduce a couple of cluster theory in a hopefully sufficient way, and then I will tell you how we can improve couple of cluster theory, and spoiler alert, this will be by bootstrapping uh, the density matrix through normalization group method. Okay. So let's dive into this. The first uh, uh, sort of weird thing about the quantum many-body problem or quantum chemistry problems is that Depending on what compound we are studying, our underlying Galerkin space changes because it has to host a number of 
different electrons. So really what we need when we talk about discretization is a recipe on how we build our Galarkin space. We basically have two constraints on the basis functions. So the first one is that we want them to be L2 orthonormal. And the reason is simple. That's that L2 orthonormal functions are very easy to work with computationally. Okay, so this is a, a practical constraint. Whereas the second one, the anti-symmetry, is actually dictated by the physics. You know, so we are considering electrons. They adhere to Pauli's exclusion principle, which results in the wave function being anti-symmetric. So how do we go about this? The idea is when we are facing a molecule, we look at what are the individual atoms that form this molecule, and we are trying to describe at the very first step the electrons within the individual atoms. Okay? Now, here's a sketch. Yeah, so I go over to my physics or chemistry friends and say, hey, I have the following molecule. In this case, you can think about this as H2. There's one nucleus sitting here, one nucleus sitting here. And then they provide me with the number of basis functions describing the individual atoms, uh, the individual electrons in the vicinity of these, um, of these atoms. Okay. And then what we are doing is so we that's actually. Just the solution of, of the single electron problem with that potential? Or uh, so these potential? are, so as, as a goodie, these are so the, the, um, the atomic orbitals. And they come from the idea that if you have a, let's say we, we pick something in the periodic table. You, know, you have some inner shell that is shielding the nucleus from the valence electrons. So you look at this as a quasi uh, hydrogen atom, and then you take the solutions to the hydrogen atom to form um, the valence shells. And then you yeah. symmetrize and anti-symmetrize, or what? That There's is two correct. atoms here. That's my question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So let, let's go through this. What is happening? So the, the mathematical intuition is we want to do what is easiest, right? Which would be a product ansatz. But uh, as we all know, the product ansatz is not anti-symmetric if we swap. Through entries, we will not pick up on the minus sign. But you can anti-symmetrize the product ansatz, uh, which is mathematically known as the wedge product. Yeah? And the wedge product, very nicely, extends to a, a k-fold wedge product. So the general situation is the following. I have my molecule, and I have a number of atoms that form this molecule. And I go to my uh, chemistry or physics friends, and they provide me with the set of single particle functions, so the functions that describe the individual electrons. And then what I do is I form all kinds of possible n-fold wedge products of these functions. Now, of course, if I swap two functions in the wedge product, I pick up on a minus sign. So this construction does not yield a basis. It rather overdetermines the space. But I can fix this by enforcing that the indices labeling the individual one particle functions are strictly increasing. Okay? And that's it. Yeah? So basically, my n electron basis function is determined uniquely by a string of length n that tells me which orbitals I use to form this n fold wedge product. Okay? And then, well, my Galerkin space is just spanned by all possible uh, n fold wedge products that I can form. Not strictly orthogonal. So if the individual chi i are orthogonal, then this orthogonality carries on through the wedge product. They won't, though, because you put hmm? They won't be exactly. Well, if you do, if you form uh, molecular orbitals, orthogonality is one constraint, so then you have it. Yeah, but the atomic orbitals are in general not. That's, That's what I was wondering. Do you form your yeah. orbitals from the atomic orbitals, or do you write away yeah. compute molecular orbitals? So when I then... Ultimately, when we talk about couple cluster theory, we do this in the molecular orbitals. So in that case, um, uh, these guys would look slightly different. They would have gone through the Hartree-Fock optimization, and then they are orthogonal, orthonormal even. And then also, for, for people who are uh, somewhat familiar, so here's a normalization uh, factor that I dropped, but it doesn't matter for the expressibility of the, of the whole space if I have a constant in front of that. But in practice, we would want these functions to be uh, normalized, so there will be 1 over square root of n uh, factorial there. Yeah. Any, any, further, any, 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 any questions regarding the, the construction of this Galerkin space? No, I think we're all on the, all good. OK, so, so now we have our, we formed our space. And if you count it sort of carefully, you see, OK, we have n electrons. 
and we have k single particle functions. So I can actually form k choose n of these Slater determinants or, or of these uh, n particle basis functions. Yeah, so this still scales uh, pretty badly. Yeah, so very rapidly, I will not be able to apply conventional numerical methods to um, the discretized Hamiltonian in this basis. So what do we do is we form different ansatz and using, use different methods. And the one that I'm advocating for today is the couple of cluster ansatz. Uh, so the idea is the following. I have my wave function, psi, and I express it as e to the t times phi zero. So let's take this apart. So phi zero is what we call our reference state. So this is one basis vector that we pick. Yeah? So there's a physical intuition behind how we form this, but mathematically, we can just think about this. Phi zero is the n electron basis function that we obtain by taking the n-fold wedge product of my very first n uh, single particle functions. I wanted to have low energy, yes, but uh, for the construction, it doesn't matter at this point, but you're absolutely right. The intuition is these are the MOs, and we form the lowest um, energetic state. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So are your, how is your basis ordered? Increasing in energy. So this is um, what he was, was hinting at. There's an underlying optimization procedure going on that induces an, an energy ordering of these um, individual states. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. If I change the ordering, of course, this, this expression will change. But in construction, it will remain the same. Yeah. OK, so this is this phi 0. And t is a matrix. OK, so I will tell, I'll tell you what t is in just a second. But for now, let's accept there exists such a matrix such that I can form, uh, that I can express the state of this form. OK, so let's see what happens to our eigenvalue problem if we substitute this ansatz. Yeah. So exponential t is invertible. So we can move it over to the other side. We obtain this similarity transformed Hamiltonian applied to our basis vector phi 0 is equal to the energy phi 0. And now, so what we can do is we can form projective equations. Okay? So we can project onto phi 0. So you're pretending psi 0 is like on state. You're pretending or assuming that t gives you precisely the ground state. Uh, right, yeah. Right, right. So if we make this assumption, then projecting onto phi zero recovers the energy given normalization of um, our basis functions. And if we project on anything that is orthogonal to phi zero, we get zero. So ultimately, what's going to happen is we will use these equations to determine t. And then we plug t into this expression and get our energy. Now I really have to tell you what t is, because this is getting, uh, it's getting shaky now. All right, so let's, let's dive into t. Or may maybe questions at this point. So there's no issue with the fact that the operator is non-Hermish, which you get. So I mean, the similarity transformed Hamiltonian preserve this, preserves the spectrum. So if you were to, to diagonalize this matrix, you would recover uh, the ground state energy. Uh, however, you don't get a size improvement here. This is still a K choose N matrix. So you might as well just well, I, 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 I think my, 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 the thing I have yeah. in mind is more that, that, of course, left and right eigenvectors become, become different, which I guess is fine for the equation you write there, because yeah. uh, if you're not saying that, that these are a sum to the left eigenvector, but you just get mm -hmm. five. But still, it, it feels a bit weird to, to take a scalar product from the left with the right. So this is, this is exactly what's going to happen. So if you start, if you start truncating the x if you start making approximations on t, which is ultimately what we are doing, then you're very right, you'll get different left and right eigenstates. So if we want to compute excitation um, values using couple cluster theory, we always have to solve also for the left eigenstate. The one exception is the energy, because there you really just need t, but absolutely correct. In the second yeah. equation, then, in the approximations, you would try to put the left eigenvectors, or...? So what you do is you form uh, what's called a couple cluster Lagrangian. So you have this energy expression, and you enforce the conditions that these equations are zero. Yeah? So ultimately, what you'll get, let's try to write this down. 
have a Lagrangian in terms of t, and then uh, a community calls the, the Lagrange multipliers by lambda. You have a y0 b to the minus t h e to the t. Phi 0 some overview. Okay, so these are the couple of cluster equations that you want to enforce to be zero, and you introduce the Lagrange multipliers here. And now I'm going to do a trick. So I will talk about these excitation matrices right on the next um, slide. But what we are using is that any basis function can be expressed using these so-called uh, excitation matrices. Again, I'll explain this in just a second. It's just a, a goodie for, for people who are somewhat aware of um, what's happening. And then we can combine uh, these two equations. So what we get is phi zero. We get identity Okay, where lambda is the adjoint of the excitation matrix. And then you sort of get, well, this expression determines the left state. And this expression determines the right state. Yeah, so this is how you get these different, uh, these different left and right states. Okay. Okay, but let's go one step back. Okay. So let me try to explain to you uh, where T comes from, what these excitation matrices are, and then I think this will become uh, significantly uh, clearer. So the matrix T is what we call a cluster matrix or a cluster operator. And it is formed by these excitation matrices. Now, the idea behind excitation matrices is that we fix one reference state that we like for any for our particular reasons. In this case, this is the lowest. Uh, it has some. It minimizes some some energy measure. And then we want to express any other basis function in our Galerkin space by simply replacing indices in this, in this string. Okay, so let's make an example. Let's go back to our two electron problem and let's fix phi zero to be the wedge product of chi one and chi two. And let's say we want to perform the excitation one, two, three, i.e. the replacement of one by three. Okay, so we have this exterior product and we just simply swap chi one by chi three. Of course, this wedge product violates our, um, our condition that the descriptive index is strictly increasing. But we can just swap the order at the cost of a minus sign, and indeed, we get our basis vector phi uh, 2, 3. Okay? Make sense? So is this x notation, x3, is that the standard notation? So usually, um, X is standard, but you would write it like I, J, A, B. Uh, in a math context, this power A, B is a bit iffy. So people take um, somewhat offense to this. So what we do in math, we usually write it as I, J, A, B, where we put this into a multi-index further down, or you could write it as I, J, comma, uh, A, B. Yeah? But if you look into a quantum chemistry textbook, You'll see this. Yeah. Yeah. These are indices. Yeah. So in this case, uh, one three. Um, yes. Very good. So now, this was a replacement of one index, and of course, the natural extension is: Can you replace more than just one? And the answer is yes. Yeah. You can define uh, higher order excitations, as they call it, by just applying products of these single replacement operators. Okay. So there is a certain caveat um, that you put them into normal ordering, but in principle, this is how you define them. Yeah, so multi-index excitations is a product of single excitation replacements. Okay? Yeah. Any questions about these excitation, excitation matrices? Okay. So, since we have... Yeah, I yeah. do have a question. Yeah, go ahead. So, 
anything, can you go back? Mm -hmm. So for example, x31 acting on mm -hmm. anything where phi1 does not appear, just mm -hmm. kills it. Correct. And um, it acts on anything where chi1 and chi3 both appear and also kills it. Correct. So maybe, yeah, maybe it's instructive to write down so one of these matrices. So let's do this. <clears throat> So let's consider this simple case, uh, two electrons in um, four, four basis functions. Okay, and these are these, uh, uh, the chi i, okay? So in this context, n is equal to two, and k is equal to four, okay? So how many two particle functions can I form using four single particle functions? Well, it's four choose two, which is six, okay? So I just write them in terms of their bit string or in terms of their, their um, single particle function string. Yeah, so we have one, two, uh, one, three, one, four. What else do we have? Well, we have uh, two, three, two, four, and three, four, okay? And then uh, correspondingly, I write them down uh, here as well. And now we want to form the matrix x, one comma three. So we check, is one in the string that defines our two particle function? If so, we replace it with the string uh, index three, okay? So we've done this for one, two. What we get is a minus two, three, so if we form the matrix, if we project onto 1, 2, we get 0. If we project onto 1, 3, we get 0. If we project on 1, 4, we get 0. If we project onto 2, 3, we get minus 1. OK, and then uh, 2, 4 is uh, 0 and uh, 0. OK, so then we do the next element. We replace 1 by 3. The wedge product of 3 with 3 is 0. So Regardless onto what we project, uh, we get zeros. Okay, and then we can do the play the game for one four. So one is replaced by three. Three is smaller than four, so we don't have to swap in order to get a sign. So then uh, we get three four, which is the last one in zeros. Yeah, and then uh, two three. So first of all, there's no one. So for all of these, uh, we get zero. Okay. Yeah, thank you, that was a good question. Yeah, so these are these um, excitation matrices. And if we form products, uh, they become pretty long. And now this becomes a bit cumbersome because we have to keep track of n indices describing our n particle state. And uh, in principle, 2k indices for these replacements. This is a lot. I know this is the tensor community, so you're used to many, many indices. But for me, it's just super practical to shove all of this into one Greek index, which I call mu, okay? And mu has one property that I care about, which is its length, yeah? So I have k replacements, and that's all that I care about at this point, okay? So now we are at the, at the point where we can form our very first mathematical theorem, which is basically just putting all of this, what I said, into, yeah, a mathematical form. Uh, so we have a given reference state. Then you can very straightforwardly show that for every other basis function that is not this reference state, you can form an excitation that generates this basis vector up to a sign. Why is this a, called a theorem? It's just a result, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a straightforward result. You can call it okay. something. I, I yeah. thought I was missing something. No, no. It's just putting all the construction into a clear, clear framework, yeah. Okay, so what this allows us to do is to express every basis function using an excitation index mu, okay? So it's a very handy formulation. We can drop actually the, this uh, n length index and um, uh, characterize the basis given that we have phi zero, okay? 
So then we can form the linear hull of these excitation matrices, and that is the space of the cluster matrices, okay? So here's an example. Now we have n equal 2 and k equals 5, and I label the expansion coefficients in a way that is useful for me. Um, and you see that these matrices are highly structured. Yeah? So they're lower triangular matrices with zero on the diagonal. Okay? So then you can put all of this together. Yeah? So here you have to do a little bit of work, but it's not that much work. So maybe, I don't know, corollary, lemma. Yeah? But uh, you can basically show that if your function is, uh, has a nonlinear overlap with your chosen reference, there exists a unique T in this linear hull, such that you can express psi of this form. Okay, so here's a little boo-boo, and that is, uh, I wrote this, this result with having a non-zero overlap, but you clearly see that exponential t with phi zero has overlap one, so there's a normalization constant missing. But um, as long as we have non-zero overlap, we can always uh, renormalize in order to get this to be one. Okay? So the t is, um, got the structure built in that sort of creates a particular type of rotation. So it's all, it's all, you know, the T is tied to phi zero in the sense that it's excited from that. That's correct. So T is tied to phi zero. It's not a rotation though, because this matrix is not a... Uh, right, right. Yeah, it's yeah. Just a yeah. non But you're, you're absolutely correct. So the, the T, the construction of T is uh, tied to what the reference um, uh, is, because that defines the excitation. Because normally we think of this sort of transformation as being very non-unique, mm -hmm. right? It's like, okay, I it just had to map one state to another. Yeah. It was a unitary transformation. That, you know, yeah. All the other rows and columns could be whatever they want. Right. But this ties it. Correctly, yeah, yes, yes. So. Yeah, very good. Thanks, Thanks for the comment. Okay, so now that we have uh, un unraveled what this T is, let's revisit the couple of cluster equations and let's see how we can actually solve for them. So remember that we said that if we project on anything orthogonal to phi zero, we get zero. But now having, uh, well, introduced the excitation matrices, what we basically can note is that our Galerkin space is constructed uh, orthogonally by what is in direction of our reference and all the other n particle basis functions. Okay, so in order to avoid projecting onto the entire space, we do the standard Galerkin trick and just project onto the basis functions enforcing zero, right? So this gives us a discrete set of um, equation. Now recall that T was an expansion of these excitation matrices. Now if you start counting how many mu's do we have that are non-zero? And how many mu's do we involve in this expansion expression? They are exactly the same, okay? So if we plug in this expansion, what we get is a squared system of equations that we are trying to solve, okay? And these are, these are the couple cluster equations. So now let's... Wait, what's the definition of phi mu again? This was the reference state. So in, if we have the MOs, yeah, phi zero is yeah. And the phi mu are oh, that's just the other states from that. Phi mu are all the other states. Yes. So we define the excitation matrices with respect to phi zero, and then we can form basically obtained by acting with x mu. Correct. 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 Yeah. Okay, so if we now take a second to see what has happened here, is I basically showed you how to rewrite a very large linear problem as a very large nonlinear problem. So that sounds like a bad deal, right? I mean, you shouldn't, you shouldn't take that. Uh, the advantage of couple cluster theory, though, is that when you start truncating, this expansion and then project onto the corresponding coefficients that are involved in this expansion, you get much better uh, computational uh, results. So the accuracy is much higher than 
compared if you just project onto a smaller subspace and diagonalize the Hamiltonian on the smaller subspace. And how, how do you decide how to truncate by yes. energy level? Yes, that's a very good question. So, so what, what's on the goal? The you try to, to find the optimum t, small t. Right? Exactly. Yeah, so this, this, is the, uh, this is the $1 million question. How do you decide correctly how to truncate your expansion in couple cluster theory? And if you, again, hit the Google search button, you'll see that even within couple cluster theory, there's a bewildering zoo of abbreviations telling you that different uh, sparsity patterns can be enforced onto T or other um, perturbative corrections can be made to improve couple cluster theory. Okay, so uh, there are many ways and you can come up with your own uh, sparsity pattern and develop your own couple cluster theory if you, if you wish so. But what, what do you truncate? You can truncate the T? You right? truncate the expansion. So the small Ts? Yeah. You don't truncate the equations. You still have all the F U of T equals zero. You project only onto those mu that are involved in the expansion. But you exponent. Yeah. Oh, I see. The exponentiation doesn't give you extra terms because they square to zero. Yeah. So the exponentiation of this one will actually give you uh, terms that you do not get if you project the Hamiltonian onto a smaller subspace. So if you were to do, um, let's say you, you restrict your bases, uh, your, your, your n-particle bases, to only consist of excitations of order two. Yeah, so you form this, this subspace, H tilde, yeah, and H tilde are x mu acting on phi zero, uh, where uh, mu is smaller or equal than two. Okay? So then what I could do is I can I can project the Hamiltonian down, I get a much smaller system and solve it. But in this formulation, my found wave function will only involve um, contributions of this form. Whereas if I do the exponential t, and if t is truncated, acting on phi zero, I will get contributions of uh, triple, quadruple, and so on. So back to the question, which f mu do you consider? Which equations? All, yeah. all non-trivial ones, or, or you also truncate those? No, you, you truncate those. You have to, to, to keep it square. Well. So you truncate yeah. the t, yeah. but you also kick out yeah. some equations which yes. would be non-trivial. And this, exactly, exactly, yes. So you can, what people are doing sometimes is you, you involve this information. So you solve t on this, um, on this smaller set of mu, and then you compute the projections onto, let's say, triples. And this information is used in this uh, CCSD parentheses t method. Yeah? So there are many ways you can, you can use this, but you're absolutely right. If you project onto a smaller subset, you not necessarily guarantee that other projections are automatically zero. Yeah. So it's a kind of naive mm. question. So these chi u's, are, are they particularly meaningful? And if it's just the space they span is meaningful? I mean, I, chi mu. or rather the, the, the fees. The fee. The fees for the variable yeah. here, because you're taking wedge products of mm -hmm. chi. Yeah. And are you interested in their span or the, these individual fees? I, I, I'm kind of. So I'm actually that. more. Zero has meaning for you. Is that it does. It does have some meaning for me, but in terms of couple cluster theory, you can get away with just being interested in the span. I mean, they do carry a lot of physical information because they come from a pre-performed calculation. Um, but in terms of the expressibility and the power of this method. You don't have to bake this into uh, into your intuition. So, so let me ask a, yeah. a slightly different question, right. um, but related is: so these these fees are points on the Grossmannian. Yes. Um, are you interested in the whole Grossmannian, or you're primarily interested in these particular points on it, and then sums of them? No, I'm interested in the whole in the whole Grassmannian. Ultimately, I want to minimize over the whole set of um, functions that I can form. Yeah. Yeah. So let's let's try to get back to these truncations of the cluster matrix. Oh, how much time do I? Have? Ten minutes. Okay. 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 I will. I'll rush. So, the most common approximation is um, just by rank of these excitations. 
So if we have two-fold excitations, we do CCSD, including single and two-party body replacements. It's somewhat justified because in quantum chemistry, we have two-body interactions. Uh, so including uh, two-body replacements makes sense. However, there's no mathematical reason for why uh, this is sort of the best sparsity pattern in the expansion coefficients that you can, um, that you can get. Okay. Now this truncation makes computations feasible and gives good results for a very large um, portion of problems. However, when you apply a couple of cluster theory to these so-called strongly correlated systems that I pictorially introduced in the beginning, it actually becomes unreliable. Okay? So it's not true that a couple of cluster uh, dramatically fails for all strongly correlated systems. For some, it actually works quite well. Um, but you don't know a posteriori. So when we keep in mind that couple cluster un the couple cluster ansatz is actually exact in the untruncated limit. So maybe there's hope, right? Maybe our sparsity pattern that we enforce is just not good enough to recover the wave function to the extent that we want. Yeah? And this is actually the quantum chemistry folklore that circles in this community as if you were to compute the full coefficient vector for any system, it would be relatively sparse. It's just a question, what is this sparsity pattern? And now comes uh, the bootstrap. Okay, so let's say we somehow fetch additional information on our system and incorporate this into our couple of cluster ansatz. So let's, we'll, we'll make this a bit more precise, but this is basically the idea. Okay, so what is the, the computational picture child? Yeah, it's the chromium dimer. It's a very challenging system computationally. Uh, interestingly, uh, 2022, uh, Garnett Chan and his group published a paper saying that this chapter of quantum chemistry is closed, which is fine. Yeah? So we understand this computationally. Still, we can use this to benchmark our developed methods. Okay? So what makes the chromium dimer so difficult? Well, in its bare dimer form, it has a sextuple bond. So it really does not like to be dissociated, making these computations extremely challenging. Yeah? Here's the result, 2016, when people first used the DMRG in the context of tailored couple clusters. So I will, I will decipher this acronym in a second. This is just, let's just look at these computational results. We see CCSD, CCSDTQ, so this is a very expensive calculation. And we have uh, so the quote unquote gold standard CCSD parentheses T. And you look at the uh, retrieved correlation energy it dramatically increases as you go from CCSD to CCSD parentheses T all the way to SDTQ. And here is our uh, DMRG TCC method with a small active space. So again, I will I'll narrow down on all these individual parts. Okay? But you see that the amount of correlation energy retrieved with this method is significantly higher compared to CCSD. It's actually quite uh, comparable to CCSD parentheses T. And uh, uh, later on, as you increase, I mean, eventually you'll, you'll get all of it. So this distance is rather short, right? And it's sort of favoring couple cluster. That is correct. So this distance is uh, very close to the equilibrium. So this is where it is, um, where it is stable. Um, the catch with Taylor couple cluster theory for it to work very well is that we need a certain balance of contributing parts to the correlation energy. Yeah, so this is something where I did not necessarily want it to go, but there are two causing, I mean, three in total causing factors of these electronic correlation effects. And for this method to work well, you need uh, two of them to be, to be balanced. You know, otherwise, um, the DMRG suffers or a couple cluster suffers. Okay? So uh, yeah, for this, for this bond distance, it is actually uh, favorable for, for this method. Yeah. Okay, so let's, now that we've, been motivated enough that this method can compute stuff reasonably well. Let's try to understand what it is doing. Okay, so this is called the Taylor couple cluster method, and it has two fundamental assumptions. So the assumption number one is that the expansion of the full cluster matrix can be partitioned into two parts. One part that is extremely well approximated by taking only singles and doubles into account. And a second part 
that may contain higher excitations? We don't know. But this is where the second assumption comes into play. It namely says that, OK, whatever is in this I2 is taken care of externally. So this is something provided to us, these S. Okay? So these are very strong assumptions. right? Being able to, to partition T in this particular form is a non-trivial task, as well as accessing these S. Okay? So how do we do this? Yeah. Okay, so if we, let's, let's first see what happens if we substitute this ansatz in the couple of cluster equations. Well, we somewhat parameterize the equations for a fixed S and only optimize uh, for T. Okay, so this makes the equations significantly smaller, so we can compute uh, even larger systems. But let's see how we can actually obtain um, uh, ensure assumption one and two. Okay, so question is, how do we split the cluster matrix and how do we obtain the coefficients? Okay, and here comes uh, the use of DMRG. So DMRG can be used for two things. And in the DMRG tailored couple cluster variant, there are actually two DMRG runs that are performed. The first one is used to detect the electronic correlations. And this will tell you how to form your smaller problem, yeah, how to form this index set I1 and I2. And then we do a second run, given the size of I2 and our computational abilities, we crank up the accuracy of DMRG and try to get as high accuracy results as possible on this much smaller index set I2. Okay, so this is the, this is the idea. Let's narrow this down a bit more and see how do we detect um, electronic correlations using the DMRG. So there are basically two ways. I mean, there are probably many more, but uh, I'm aware of two that we, that we used. One is to use the single side entropy. So the single side entropy is uh, just a regular entropy expression. And what you plug in is the ith mode density matrix. So the way to think about this is we have our DMRG solution, U, on the full space. We hold one index fix and contract all the others. So we form a very tall and skinny matrix, which is this uh, UI. And we contract over this, uh, this large dimension. So we get a small two by two matrix. And then we plug it into this entropy expression. Now what this tells us is how much information flows out of this ith orbital. Yeah? So how much does this individual orbital communicate with the remaining system? So a bit more refined information can be obtained from the mutual information, which is defined for pairs. Yeah? So this is uh, just an expression. You have the different single side entropies and you subtract uh, the two side entropy. So this expression is a natural extension of this one, so I don't put the, the formulas uh, on the board again. But uh, this is a very simple uh, expression to compute. And what it tells you is how much information flows between orbital i and orbital j. Yeah, so you get like a two, two body uh, correlation out of this mutual information. Since we are looking at uh, quantum chemical, quantum chemistry problems, this seems like a reasonable uh, thing to compute. So now the catch is we have to run this on the full system. Yeah, so the question is how robust are these quantities with respect to the rank? Right? Because if the system is large, we can only do low rank approximations. And you see that at least qualitatively, these results are extremely, extremely robust with respect to the rank. So we look at N2 in a reasonably, reasonably large um, basis set. And we look at three dissociation lengths. One is in the, in the equilibrium geometry, one is a bit more stretched, and one is really stretched, where it really does not want to be. And we compute the single side entropy for a number of uh, ranks, 64 all the way to 1,000. And you see that at least this plateau shape uh, is recovered also by low rank um, approximation. What is this plot showing? What's the x-axis? So the x-axis. Uh, usually what we do is we label the orbitals, but here they're just, um, they are, they are, they're reordered such that it is in a decreasing order. But usually what you have is oh, that's other the sides. Entropy for each of the orbitals. That's correct. Yeah. And here, uh, so out of where this is sitting, you can extract uh, which orbital interacts a lot. So this is used for the active space construction. Now the mutual information is of course longer. It's 
intuitively uh, nicer, but evaluating these, um, these plots is a bit harder than evaluating these guys. Okay, so let me rush, let me rush through this. So one question that we had is to see how, um, how robust is the DMRG TCC with respect to the active space. Yeah, and you see that it is actually um, near the equilibrium. It has actually some very undesirable features that the energy goes up as you increase the active space. So this is something that you would not want. Intuitively, what you would want as you increase the active space, you include more and more um, of the strong correlation, and the DMRG performs better and better and better. Now, at some point, your system gets larger and larger and larger, and if you only do low rank on the active space, then the DMRG will, at some point, not be able to recover this, what's called the dynamical correlation, so the result gets worse. And this is also what you see here. But the curve is not so nice. Yeah? So we would want, a priori, ideally, knowledge of where this, this minimum sits, because then we would know uh, how to form the active space. Okay, um, and this trend uh, deshapes because as we start stretching, a different source of correlation takes over, which is much more favorable for the DMRG and much worse for couple cluster theory. So then you don't get this, um, this expected concave shape anymore. But an important feature of the method is to see that even for small active spaces, yeah, so for this point, DMRG TCC performs pretty well outperforms couple cluster theory. Yeah, so this is at least a very good sign. You know, although, ideally, we want to get into this, um, this minimum. OK, so what's the, what's the takeaway um, from this presentation or from the slides so far? Uh, Taylor couple cluster always outperforms CCSD. So that's good. Right? So we have a very robust method for a large portion of uh, chemical problems. Uh, tailoring this um, improves significantly. Now we have somewhat, uh, well, unfavorable behavior when it comes to the active space choice. Yeah? But at the same time, our scanning was kind of artificial. Really what we've been doing is we just started shoving orbitals into the active space. And that way you break correlations between orbitals that should not be broken. Yeah? So this is something you would not necessarily do in practice. The method is um, highly promising, I would say, because it has uh, some black box features. So you can apply it almost at the press of a button to um, now challenging systems. Another thing that is interesting to point out is that the couple cluster correction does not seem to care about what is the, the solution on the active space. So you could, in principle, think about correcting an excited state in this framework. Of course, there's a caveat. You have to make sure that the excited state is not orthogonal to phi zero, which rules out many problems. But as long as the excited state has some kind of overlap to, um, to your reference, you could apply uh, this to excited states. I'm getting a nervous look, so let me, yeah. let me conclude <laughs> at this point. There are some mathematical results, but uh, I will thank you for, for your attention.